During World War I, air power developed into a crucial element each nation needed to invest in. While balloons and dirigibles had been used to scout for some time, the introduction of aeroplanes opened up a whole new dimension in the sky. Planes circling the enemy trenches could direct artillery fire, nimble fighters harassed and destroyed enemy planes, and mighty bombers would drop ordnance wherever they wished. Without a strong and stable air component, no major power could hope to win the Great War. Yet, amongst all major powers, air assets remained under the control of the traditional service branches of Navy and Army. An independent air service did not exist, until the Royal Air Force appeared in 1918. But how and why did Britain, home to the Army's Royal Flying Corps and the Navy's Royal Naval Air Service, form an independent air branch when all other nations didn't? And why did it choose to do so on April Fool's Day 1918? Let's answer these questions. Even before World War I, Britain was considering the establishment of an independent air force. Preliminary plans were drawn up, financing and force structures considered. Yet with the commencement of hostilities in 1914, these plans were shelved. After all, now was the time to win a war and not handicap efforts by reshuffling the force structure. So instead, the Royal Flying Corps of the Army and the Royal Naval Air Service of the Navy kept Britain in the air independently of each other. Generally, an independent air force allows for a more efficient and economically functioning force. This is because aircraft development and design, tactics development, as well as maintenance and standardization would follow one centralized vision, instead of multiple among separate functioning entities. After all, why pay for two services when you could just be paying for one? As one member of parliament put it, for the essential truth on which the flying service must be founded is that only aviators understand aviation. The great gain of a separately organized air service would be its emancipation from the control of the Admiralty and the War Office, who are very apt to think they know more than they do. During the war, additional considerations presented reasons for a unified and independent air force namely the allocation of scarce manpower and resources. The challenges associated with maintaining and equipping two separate air forces thus give reason to find common ground. Yet the initial opinion was that the war had to be won first. So for now, Britain aimed to only pool scarce resources and create unity to matters related to aircraft design and production. In early 1916, the Joint War Air Committee was thus formed. Within months, this initiative broke down. Given no binding powers, it had little influence in the first place. Even membership was problematic. The army's representative was of the army council. This allowed him to commit to a course of action. Yet the navy's representative was de facto a liaison officer, useful only for passing information between the air committee and the admiralty. This early failure was perhaps inevitable. Yet unresolved issues provided the impetus to try again. Thus, in May 1916, the Joint Air Board was established. The board held privileges that made it more than just a token effort. It could discuss matters of air policy, make recommendations on equipment procurement, and refer recommendations to the War Committee should either service decline to cooperate. Additionally, it was supposed to prevent competition between the Army and Navy, good luck with that, and provide a campus dedicated to problem solving in matters of equipment and air policy. Initial progress was slow. The authority of the Air Board was not yet established. Case in point, when the Admiralty passed budgetary expenditures to the Navy in August 1916, it completely bypassed the Air Board and the Board's naval representative was unable to answer specific questions. The Joint Air Board existed but it remained a sideshow in the politics of war for now. Disagreements between the army and navy seemed irreconcilable. The latter favored long-range bombers, the former a consistent overall fighting strength on the front lines involving fighters, reconnaissance and ground attack. Consider the issue beyond the different aircraft types that needed to be produced. The ratio between bombers and fighters influenced all sorts of logistical problems, from aircraft production aircraft engine production and pilot training to required raw materials and basing. Britain, even with production help from France, could not fulfill the material deliveries that both the army and navy demanded. 
By the end of 1916, the 30 plus meetings of the Air Board had achieved little. Yet the war continued and the need for arbitration became ever more pressing and these meetings did help to slowly break up the stalemate. In early 1917, the second Air Board was convened. Crucially, its competences and powers were expanded. The following statement sums up this initial breakthrough. For the purposes of organizing and maintaining the supply of aircraft in the national interest in connection with the present war, it shall be lawful for His Majesty to establish an Air Board. The President of the Air Board shall be deemed to be a minister appointed under this Act. The Air Board shall, in relation to aircraft, have such powers and duties of any governmental department or authority. The Air Board itself was made up of various representatives, with the major players represented by the Navy, Army, the controller of aeronautical supplies and the petrol engine department. This allowed the Air Board to decide what aircraft should be produced and to whom they were delivered. The first part was achieved and the board handled this logistical nightmare very well. Yet, it remained a far cry from an actual air ministry. As the stalemate on the front lines continued, a battle of epic proportion raged within the air board. A daily office barrage of memos, pens and ink culminated in an archetypical bureaucratic slugging match, with both the army and navy finding little compromise. Now well into 1917, the air war was rapidly escalating. For Britain, three problem areas became particularly pressing. First, all air elements on the Western Front had to be strengthened in the face of mounting German pressure. Second, anti-U-boat warfare became ever more important. And third, the inadequate air defense of the home island. You'll note that these elements are largely defensive in nature and are somewhat at odds with the Royal Navy's enthusiasm for offensive long-range bombing missions. There remained misgivings about creating a new ministry, staff and force during a raging war, but it became ever more important. Home defense specifically, due to mounting public pressure, gave politicians the impetus to find a solution. Now if you want to see how a typical British homeland defense airfield looked at the time, Check out this great video by my buddies over at the Great War. By the fall of 1917, the Smuts Committee essentially arrived at the following conclusion. An air ministry, are we doing this or not? Now obviously I'm paraphrasing. Now you'll remember that thus far, the Air Board had power over production, but none over training, doctrine or air policy. To capitalize on the increasing availability of aircraft, and the doctrinal advances, a dedicated air staff was necessary, as was the corresponding air ministry. You'll remember the quote from before, only aviators understand aviation. As Hugh Trenchard put it, Britain needed an air force spirit. This would be no easy task. Now in case you are interested, Hugh Trenchard was one of the foundational characters of the RAF. If you want to know more about him and how he influenced RAF doctrine, check out the indicated video. The complexity of creating a new service branch should not be understated. The logistical and organizational aspects are critical by themselves, but even more fundamental questions such as the chain of command, storage, procurement, recruitment, training, and even the soldier's pay had to be answered. As the complexity of the task became clearer, the army worried that the transfer of squadrons from the Royal Flying Corps to what would later be called the RAF, could weaken the Allied aerial presence along the front line and give the Germans free reign. Field Marshal Douglas Haig doubted the new Air Force ability to take up the crucial task of training in such a short time. The already tight integration of the Royal Naval Air Service in the Navy provided additional challenges. There were also worries that a civilian at the helm of an air ministry would not bring the necessary panache required to win the war. One report at the time read, an air ministry with a civilian head and uncontrolled by any outside naval and military opinions, exposed as it would inevitably be to popular and fractional clamor, would be very liable to lose its sense of proportion and be drawn towards the spectacular, such as bombing reprisals and home defense, at the expense of providing the essential means of cooperation with our naval and military forces. The irony of this report from 1917 is that it came from a certain Hugh Trenchard, 
the man who would later be put in overall command of the RAF and became one of its fiercest defenders as well as a proponent of strategic bombing. Nevertheless, it suddenly all moved very fast. In November 1917, the Air Force Bill was introduced to Parliament. A short time later, it passed. In it, it exclaimed, It shall be lawful for His Majesty to raise and maintain a force, to be called the Air Force. On the 2nd of January 1918, the Air Ministry became a reality. Just a few months later, and without any fanfare or celebration, on April 1st, 1918, the Royal Air Force was formally established. This means that only in a couple of days from the release of this video, the Royal Air Force will celebrate its 100th birthday. So at this point I want to say, Happy Centennial Royal Air Force! Now the matter of fact manner this formality was conducted back in April 1918 speaks volumes about the apprehensions regarding the RAF many, including soldiers and officers, had at the time. The Army and Navy now surrendered administration and ownership of men, material and equipment. A force of 165,000, including 25,000 officers, became independent. By the way, only 8% of them were actual aviators. Some caveats remained. The Navy retained some operational control over naval aircraft at sea, and balloons remained part of the Army. As well as that, the independent bombing force, which conducted strategic bombing on the trenchard, answered directly to the air ministry. For the rest, anything that flew, fighter, bomber or butterfly belonged to the RAF. Now, For more information on the independent air force, check out the advertised video. Now, At this point you might ask yourself, why April's 1st? After all, that's April Fool's Day. This inconvenient timing wasn't lost on policymakers at the time, but April 1st also represented the start of the next fiscal year for Britain, thus it was the obvious bureaucratic choice. You should also keep in mind that the personnel that was transferred to the RAF was transferred as a temporary force for a period of maximum four years. Problems resulting out of this would later come to haunt the RAF during the interwar years, which were not kind to the air service. Now Britain became the only country among all major belligerents of World War I to create an independent force while fighting the war. Sure enough, Germany gave the air commanders considerable freedom during various stages of the war, and France had an arguably stronger air service. But both kept their planes firmly in the hands of established service branches. Also America was only just getting started building up an air service. By the way, if you want to learn about America's air service during World War I, check out the video I made in cooperation with the United States World War I Centennial Commission. Now, One of the points I want to address is that many remember the RAF as the oldest independent air force in the world. But it really depends on how you look at it. Now, Finland created its independent air force on the 6th of March 1918, a few weeks before the RAF. However, there are some important nuances. First, at the time Finland was embroiled in a civil war lacking centralized leadership and only had a handful of planes, mainly foreign donations compared to the several thousand that Britain had. Second, and although we shouldn't understate the organization that went into it, the establishment of the Finnish Air Force was more of a spur of the moment thing, while Britain was actively working on creating the RAF for over a year and set up their air ministry in early 1918. Waiting for April 1st, 1918 was for bureaucratic convenience, while the Royal Air Force in a way already existed on paper. Regardless, it isn't a competition in the first place, but for the sake of completion I felt it important to point this out. So next time you read something about the RAF, just give yourself a second or two to remember that the beautiful Nordic country of Finland was right there with them. Noteworthy too is that public opinion did in fact play some part in creating the RAF. It wasn't that Britons at home demanded an independent air service. They couldn't care less if it was the Royal Flying Corps, the Royal Naval Air Service or the Royal Air Force that did the fighting. But the Goffa raids and continuing vulnerability at home created a demand for structural change on how the war was conducted. While Britain could have continued with both the Royal Flying Corps and Royal Naval Air Service, and created the Royal Air Force after the war, the fact that they chose to do it in wartime shows a certain practicality to their thinking. It should also be remembered that neither America, Austria-Hungary, 
Germany, Italy or Russia found themselves in the same position as Britain, where the need for an independent air service was similarly pressing. Of course, just because the RAF existed did not mean that all problems were off the table. For now it was equal in title only. The new service had yet to build up its service branch, a tradition of its own and establish itself as a fundamental piece within Britain's military. Indeed, the early commanders of the Royal Air Force had to painstakingly defend the RAF's ground and assets over the coming months and years, not just from politicians and the treasury, but also from the army and the navy. The future of the RAF was called into question multiple times, its disbandment even considered, but these efforts ultimately failed. As the service was reduced considerably after World War I, from 185 squadrons to a mere 28, it wasn't until the mid-1930s that it bloomed up once more. If you've enjoyed the video, please share it and consider supporting me on Patreon. Every contribution helps in improving future content. Now if you want to learn more about some early World War I fight doctrine, check out this video. Or if you want to see my defense on what many have termed as the worst plane of World War II, check out this video. As always, have a great day, good hunting and see you in the sky.